Well, good afternoon. Um, I hope you enjoyed your delicious lunch and will give me 20 minutes of your time to talk about survivorship, no small task. Um, I think all of us in this room should give a special round of applause to the MDONS organizers, the MDONS board, Total Health, everybody who's made this possible, so thank you. I am never going to take another live in-person event for granted ever. So to see um, friends, colleagues that I haven't seen in four years, it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you for giving up what you gave up today to be here, um, whether it was driving a little further or whether you're at home, hi Charity, it's nice to connect with you all. And as I transition, um, by all means, please feel free to email me if you have any questions or there's anything I may do. I think it's important for us to also um, thank our patients, thank our caregivers. I think those of us in healthcare um, definitely understand that we don't work in a nine to five banking job where you punch out exactly at five o'clock. But to our patients, they're going through this journey and to the caregivers, they're going through their own journey. It's their loved one. They're dealing with the parking, the pharmacy, making sure that appointments are scheduled, making sure that questions are addressed, making sure bills are paid, and that there's food that tastes good or is at least reasonable to consider eating um, for their loved ones. So May is Oncology Nurses Month, so um, we should also celebrate us as a profession. I think having been an oncology nurse since 1997, um, it's important to look at where we've come and then now look in 2023, we actually have people living years with diagnoses of uh, metastatic melanoma and ovarian cancer. Um, I've been a member of MDONS, or excuse me, of um, ONS since 1997 when I was a new Navy nurse in Virginia. And I looked down 11 stories in the big building and found my boss with bright blue eyeshadow smoking. And I figured that I needed some direction with my career, so um, thank you, ONS, for that. And then, um, I volunteer for the Colorado Cancer Coalition. We're charged with the Colorado Cancer Plan, so I encourage you to check that out. Also, um, I have a research project which I look forward to submitting by the end of this month for consideration to be published, looking at um, outcomes of people who have received survivorship care plans. What I can tell you is that many people who receive survivorship care plans are seeking health care following treatment. But what I can also tell you is that they're not getting the recommended tests and screening that they need. And so that's our charge is oncology nurses to make sure that we do what we can on the end as well. As a retired naval officer, I will tell you that it is more than the bell. and. Um, the bell has many different meanings to many different people. On a ship, you'll have junior enlisted polishing the bell, taking great pride and making sure that it passes inspection. It also announces dignitaries on US Navy and Coast Guard ships, so admirals, commanding officers, and people who may be ambassadors. A bell can sound general quarters, so fires and um, floods. But also, the bell has made its way to many infusion centers, many radiation rooms, and I will tell you that the bell still has many powerful meanings for people. So I leave this thought with you. I had an active duty 04 Coast Guard uh, Lieutenant Commander who had metastatic colorectal cancer in 2017. His CEA was over 4,000. Normal goes to three. All he wanted to do every day was put on his uniform and go forward and do his job. 
And every time he heard that bell ring because somebody finished treatment, what do you think he thought? So when you look at the bell the next time you're, in work, you're at work, I just encourage you to have an open mind and think about inclusion. And ONS has many articles that have been published on this very topic. So the meaning of survivorship, there are many different meanings. Professionally to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, and I will tell you that the definition just changed this year with the latest revisions. A survivor is anybody from the time of diagnosis. Their definition in the past also included family members. And with this year's revision, it appears that, excuse me, that the definition is also focusing on the metastatic survivorship population. Uh, the Office of Cancer Survivorship through the National Cancer Institute, I believe, also includes family and caregivers. So again, the whole family taking care of everybody. What does the term survivor mean to your patients? Some people want to wear the pink, they want to wear the blue, they want to wear the teal, they want to tell everybody about their journey and their experience. Many people, however, just want to put that book back on the bookshelf and go on with their lives and go forward. What does the term survivorship mean? I think our palliative care lecture summed it up well with the umbrella term. And survivorship and surveillance are, are definitely different terms. Surveillance happens after active treatment ends. So people want to live as well as possible as long as possible. Nobody wakes up and says, gee, today's the day I want to die. And our patients, regardless of their diagnosis, do want good quality of life, and they want as much time as possible. So cancer in Colorado. I realize that the font is pretty small, but basically, the leading cause of death in the state of Colorado is cancer. Heart disease is right behind it, and that's a difference for um, those of us in Colorado versus those of us nationwide. In Colorado, the most common types of cancer for women include breast, lung, and colorectal, while for men, they include prostate, lung, and colorectal. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of seeing young people diagnosed with colorectal cancer. So if you have a stubborn brother like mine, do whatever you can to get them screened for colorectal cancer beginning at age 45. Those guidelines have changed recently. Also, mammography guidelines have changed according to the um, preventative task force. In the state of Colorado, we know that two thirds of people are living more than five years with a diagnosis. So cancer is a chronic condition. It's not just something you know that used to be a death sentence like when I was a new nurse in 1997. Five out of 10 people will be diagnosed with cancer, or five out of 10 men will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime, and four out of 10 females will be diagnosed with cancer. Almost two million people will be diagnosed this year nationwide. In Colorado, that's approximately 29,000 people. So they're everywhere. Somebody in this room is dealing with a family member, a loved one, their own personal journey. Think about how many Mile High stadiums filled with people are going through this experience that they didn't ask to go for. In 2040, there will be approximately 26 million people living with histories of cancer. And notice I didn't use the word survi survivors, sort of like homelessness and living with housing insecurity. So words matter when you're talking to people. Unfortunately, it's possible to be diagnosed with more than one type of cancer. And I'm really good at doing survivorship plans for people with three, five different diagnoses. So just because you've had your screening colonoscopy doesn't mean you're exempt from seeing the dermatologist and staying on top of your melanoma screening. And then as a result of some of the treatments we give, um, people who meet us may experience elevated blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol. So we also need to think about what our treatments are doing to people as they're trying to go forward to live their best life. Here are the six standards of survivorship um, according to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. So this is what we're doing every day, whether you're working um, in a clinic, whether you're working in an infusion center, the inpatient unit. 
Um, we're looking for signs of recurrence. We're looking for new primary cancers. We wanna make sure we're addressing long-term effects to include the emotional effects of being diagnosed. Nobody wakes up and says, gee, I wanna be diagnosed with cancer and get to know my friends at the infusion center. People finish treatment, they look different, they feel different, they have scars they didn't ask for. Dr. Gunt Pauli, you know, mentioning ostomies and intimacy. I mean, mind-blowing concepts, excuse me. And then their immune system does all sorts of neat things. So you walk in one day and you leave with a prescription for Synthroid and all sorts of other things because of your immunotherapy. For our women who are taking AIs, we wanna make sure that we don't do more harm than good. So, you know, the whole goal is to keep people out of the hospital with a broken hip. What about the people with hereditary syndromes? Those who have, you know, genetic conditions. And I will tell you that the um, goal of cancer and, you know, constant revisions, if you will, with guidelines is to continue to help everyone. And if you haven't checked out you know, hereditary guidelines recently, I encourage you to do so. As nurses, we know all too well about care coordination. Um, and I will tell you that if a patient has a primary care provider, keep them. Work hard to harness that relationship. So whether you know, they're getting ready for surgery and you wanna make sure their blood sugar is optimized so that they heal well, do whatever you can to keep primary care in the toolbox. And also we wanna make sure that we plan for ongoing care. It's never too early or too late to tell somebody to move muscles. So whether they sit in their chair and do exercises, whether they go for a walk, or they take my two rescue cocker spaniels out multiple times a day, anything to move muscles and keep going. It prevents recurrence, it helps um, prevent other types of cancer and helps with every side effect. So in the top three things our patients do every day, we should encourage them to move muscles. Here are 13 different components of survivorship. And over the past few years, it's been very neat to watch this list evolve. And I need to think about how to format it better. We know our treatment impacts one's cardiac function. So what are we doing with those women who have ejection fractures of 45%. We know that um, treatment and the whole process of being diagnosed is anxiety provoking, it's traumatic. You know, nobody walks out of our infusion center and says, wow, that's exactly where I wanna be. And what does it do for relationships? What does it do for young children? You know, if you've been receiving treatment for a year every three weeks, your brain is down a different pathway. Where am I gonna park? Am I going to be able to check in early? What do I need to pick up from the pharmacy? Will my IV work today? What about my port? It was sluggish last time. So then you try and go back to your job and now you have to multitask or run a busy factory warehouse. And what do you do? I mean, your brain's been down a different rabbit hole lymphedema for head and neck cancer survivors. Who knew that was a thing like five or 10 years ago? Pain, what happens if you have such severe pain in your fingers that you can't play your musical instrument and you're a pianist? What about the hormonal effects? We had a lady this week reach out and say, hey, may I resume HRT because my hair is so dry, my skin is so dry, and I'm having sexual health side effects. Fertility, what happens if people change their mind and decide that they wanna have a child? You know, try sleeping on steroids. We've done that to them. We've made their life that much more difficult. It's hard enough in life to go through what we go through every day, let alone have a cancer diagnosis. Lifestyle, what an eye-opening experience. Oh my gosh, what foods can I eat? What supplements may I take? How can I do everything possible so that this doesn't happen again? Should I get my flu shot? Should I get my COVID vaccine? How do I go to work? How do I pay for this? These drugs are frightfully expensive. And oh, by the way, I'm working from 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. in a bakery, and I can't come to the infusion center to receive hydration because I need to keep working, because I need to have Medicaid to pay for this. Survivorship is on the continuum of quality oncology care. 
And I will tell you um, that we spend so much time making sure we have the correct pathology, that we have access, that we have a consent, that at the end, just know that there's a whole team of people to include supportive oncology, integrative medicine, palliative medicine, and cancer rehab. And again, don't forget about primary care. We need them. A cancer diagnosis has a widespread effect, and it's not like you ring the bell and these different factors disappear. Um, physical health, emotional health, spiritual health, financial health, and then social health. I talked to a lady yesterday who is so excited to go to the soup club today, but she called it the slurp club because of her neuropathy and being able to hold her soup bowl. And she said, all of my friends have changed during this process, but the people who are welcoming me back understand that I will slurp my soup this time. So every aspect of her life has been impacted. Here's a quick um, demonstration, if you will. You're diagnosed, you find your own breast mass, you go to primary care, they do the mammogram, they say, hey, we're gonna have you meet the hematology oncology team, the radiation oncology team, the surgery team. You say, okay, you're triple negative, they start you on immunotherapy, you develop issues with your skin, you're sent to the dermatologist. Then you have issues with your kidney. So now you have all of these team members to include a dermatologist and a nephrologist. And oh, by the way, then there's a whole other side of the equation looking at endocrinologists and cardiologists. So what used to be a very simple patient or a very simple situation becomes incredibly complicated with all of the different team members who each have their own special focus to help someone. When people finish active treatment, it is a very strange time. Who do they call? They don't want to burden you. You have in-basket messages. You have secure chats to respond to. You have people currently receiving treatment now. And I tell everybody to call you. I said you get paid, or we get paid to answer your phone calls. So I want patients reaching out. And I tell them to call both primary care and oncology because as professionals, it's our job to sort it out. Just have them reach out and call somebody. The mental health, the health recommendations. More than 50% of our patients are very concerned about um, their cancer returning. They may not tell you that, but that's what's keeping them up at night. Will this come back? We have many challenges, and as nurses, we certainly know that the pandemic has impacted our patients. It's impacted our workforce. It makes it more challenging to do the work that we do. We have social determinants of health. And so for those of you who are from Denver and Colorado and you've driven up and down various major roads, they look very different than they did four or five years ago. And where do people who are experiencing homelessness get their care? How do they have screening for their um, health needs? Metastatic survivorship. What do we do for the lady I saw in clinic yesterday who was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015 and thanks our team every time she sees us for helping her live well with metastatic disease? How do we address their needs? And what about the side effects of immunotherapy? For those of us in this room, we're very cancer focused, but cancer may not be their most pressing issue. It may be Parkinson's, or it may be their loved one who's experiencing end-stage dementia. What about the symptom clusters? So pain, fatigue, depression, they go together. Usually it's not just one isolated side effect. And drug shortages. So now we have to worry about cisplatin and carboplatin on shortage? What's that all about? It used to be like we had an abundance of these medications. So as oncology nurses, we need to first put our own oxygen mass on. None of us can keep doing this work if we don't take care of ourselves. And I don't know about you, but having hit rock bottom within the past few years, it really leaves an impression on us to take care of ourselves. We need to try and put our best foot forward and listen with empathy to our patients who are depending on us. And we need to get patients to do as much as they can for themselves whether it's making their own scan appointments, whether it's doing whatever they can, because we're not always gonna be able to provide the same level of care that we did four years ago. We need to encourage them to engage with technology. 
I think the, the big thing I'd like to see before I retire is how we can get reminders sent to patients. So if my car company can tell me it's time to have my car serviced, or somebody can tell me it's time to come to my house for X, Y, and Z, certainly my healthcare system can tell me it's time for my annual screening exams. And I would tell us as oncology nurses, try and make the job easier for the next person in infusion, um, the next person in the outpatient palliative care setting, anything we can do to, to communicate. And most importantly, get involved with your professional organizations. You'll find support with them and you'll be able to do more good with others. In survivorship, here are many resources that are available to you and I would encourage you to look at them. Set your Google alerts to what excites you and is passionate. Make sure you're subscribing to journal table of contents. Make sure you're on Twitter or you know what's going on in social media. Dr. Lewis, who you'll hear from later, has already been tweeting all morning about Dr. Guntapali's talk. So there's a whole new world out there. And I guarantee you, your patients can tell you what's going on on Facebook and they can tell you what's going on in these chat rooms. Know that there are professional statements and know that our patients do deserve quality care. And I leave you with this slide. Um, this is the question that I'm most often asked. What should I do so that this doesn't happen again? I encourage you to go to the American Institute for Cancer Research and download this infographic. It has 10 amazing steps that all of us should try to do. And I would tell you in Colorado, add sunscreen to that list. So if you're gonna take my obnoxious Cocker Spaniels out for exercise, make sure you're wearing a hat and sunscreen. And with that, I feel like I should leave you a sticky note because that's what I do in real world. So thank you, and thank you for what you do each and every day for our patients. Do we have any questions? Thank, Thank you. you. And the slides are available on the app. If you download the app and uh, click on to the session, uh, there's an attachment um, at the bottom of the session and you can download those slides so you can get that last slide that she was mentioning.